Thank you. Hello, everybody. Energy. Why energy? Because we need energy to drive our cars, to travel by plane, to make food, to make pure drinking water, to make the products we use every day, made out of metals and plastics. Energy is prevalent everywhere. Without energy, our society would not exist as we know it today. How does energy relate to sustainability? Sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future generations. What we know right now is we are with 7 billion people on this planet, which will grow to about 9 billion in a few decades more. Billions of those people are very poor and hardly use any energy at all. But they are aspiring the same Western energy consuming lifestyle as we have. So we know one thing for sure, energy demand will grow very quickly. We also know that our resources are finite. And when I talk about resources, I'm not talking only about energy fuel resources like oil, gas and coal, but I also talk about mineral resources which we need to make our products. Rare earth metals which are essential for wind turbines, solar panels or batteries for electric cars. So whatever the future in terms of energy will look like, we need those resources. The certainty is they are finite and the demand is growing. This is the challenge of global sustainability. And this is the challenge which I have undertaken. So, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this challenge? We need to rethink the current business paradigms about how we run businesses, how we organize businesses, and we even need to rethink the paradigm on what you learn on business management in MBAs. So, the most important thing to deal with this challenge is to tackle the topic of energy efficiency. And I will show you why. If we look at energy efficiency, then we see that several organizations, notably the International Energy Agency, have established that 36% of our current energy usage globally can be saved by different measures. That is a huge quantity. Now, if we try to relate to this quantity, imagine that we have resources on our planet which are sufficient to deliver resources for another century. That means if we have 36% less usage of those resources, we can generate the life, the affordable life and lifestyle for an extra generation. Our children or our grandchildren. So this is a major achievement. My talk will focus on how we get to this 36% efficiency improvement. To this end, we need to also understand what that means in terms of units. But it's probably most easy to visualize if we realize that this 36% savings potential is equivalent to 3 million of the largest wind turbines. The yearly energy production of 3 million very large wind turbines. The process which I would like to advocate to you is a three-step process. This three-step process is based on efficiency. Efficiency first. Then subsequently innovation and then the combination of efficiency and innovation to sustainability. We go to the first step, efficiency. Efficiency specifically in industry. Why in industry? Because if we look at the energy consumption of industry, we see that in China alone, the majority of energy consumed, 71%, is in industry. With industry, I mean specifically the heavy energy consuming industries like cement, steel, aluminium, chemicals, oil, gas, power. In Europe and in the United States, this percentage is lower. It's about 30%. So on average between one third and two thirds globally. These organizations, these companies, they have the financial and organizational capacity to deliver to those projects, to deliver to those savings. They also have a very high potential for reducing energy a profitable potential. I will highlight this with a specific example of an average plant in one of those sectors. And we look at it and we say 20% of the production cost is roughly energy. On roughly 20% of those costs we can save. So that means a 4% cost saving in total. 
That means not only a cost saving, but it also means that this plant will become more competitive in the market and will attract more production volume when it's in the downturn of the business cycle, when there is a global demand which is lower than the global production capacity. So we gain savings and we gain also extra capacity, which is good for the company and which is good for society because using less energy means less resource depletion and also means less CO2 emissions. A double whammy, so to speak. If we want to explore further, what type of measures do we need to take to implement this, this benefits into industry? We make the first step. The first step is basically based on the premise, what's measured gets done. This is the type of language which every business executive will speak. So that means that measuring what you use, measuring what you buy, measuring what you lose. It seems so trivial, but very few companies do that actually in this rigorous way. So if we have measured this, we know where we stand, we can compare ourselves to others, we can benchmark, and then we can subsequently optimize. This is all called good housekeeping. Good housekeeping can contribute to 5% savings with hardly any investments at all. This is the first step which we need to take. Subsequently, we go to the next step. In the next step, we invest. We invest much more in commercially available technologies. Commercially available technologies that increase efficiency. Think about your home applications. Think about your boiler at home. It makes a lot of difference in the energy bill whether you have an old inefficient one or a new state-of-the-art boiler. The same is true for plants on a much larger scale. So we're talking about more efficient boilers, more efficient heat exchangers, smartly integrated heat streams in the plant, we're talking about variable drive motors, optimized compressors and pumps. A whole host of opportunity is prevalent. Totally, we've now 20% savings, the average which I just previously mentioned. We're not there yet. There is another bonus which we can get, the bonus of innovation. If we apply innovation, with technologies that are ready in the lab, but not yet applied commercially, we get another 10% saving, making a total of 30%, which is quite close to the 36% we could realize for the society as a whole. So if we apply innovation in industry, we need to take a different mindset. We need to challenge the way things we always have done. That is the essence of innovation. It's easier said than done. I will tell you how we need to innovate. This is the next step of my approach. Yes. Where we go from innovation within the boundaries of the plant to innovation in a larger scale. Because if industrial companies invest and spend money on novel technologies, then that means that they create a whole ecosystem around them of technology and solution suppliers, which gets a growing business. And they will serve not only industry, but they will also serve other business sectors like retail and household. And this innovation will proliferate throughout the whole of society. Therefore, we need now to focus on the innovation process from within the walls of a plant to outside the business. We move now from industry to the whole economy. And I will give you an example of what that would look like when we look at the innovation process. We've got a whole host of novel technologies available in terms of patents, in terms of articles, in terms of prototypes ready in the lab, but they stay in the lab. Why? Because funding in labs, whether corporate labs or whether these are labs of universities or of independent research institutes, they get funding for doing research because that's what researchers like to do, to do research. So at a certain moment in time, they've got this new invention, they've published about it, it's ready, the funding stopped and there it is. In order to get to mass markets, you need to have large customers, you need to have a demand, you need to have courageous companies who says, yes, I'm willing to buy this, I'm willing to try it out in my large scale process, although there's no proof that it will work, I only got the proof that it works in the lab. That's a risk. That is where the different mindset comes in. 
So when you have these companies, these brave, courageous companies, the so-called technology adopters, they will bridge the funding gap between the research funding and the funding of the market. And then subsequently, you can get into the mass market. So bridging this gap, which is called in innovation terms, the valley of death. And you know, without water in the valley of death, you will quickly starve. So bridging this gap is important. So from my perspective, industry is the catalyst for bridging the innovation gap, not only for industry itself, but for society as a whole. I will give an example of a typical project. This project is close to my heart because I undertook it myself roughly 10 years ago, and it connects two different business sectors. It connects industry with agriculture, where the waste stream of industry, a pure CO2 gas stream, is the feedstock for the agricultural business. Because in the greenhouses, they grow vegetables, they grow flowers, and they need CO2. In spring and summer, the greenhouse owners used to burn natural gas to supply the CO2. Now you replace the costly natural gas by the waste stream of CO2 and you gain a benefit for those two business sectors. A monetary saving but also an energy saving and therefore also a reduction in CO2 emissions as a whole. Why don't we have more of those examples? Because this is still the only one in the world. Therefore, we need to get to the situation where we have achieved this global sustainability, where the innovation mentality is, is completely ingrained into society. If we would have achieved that, we can create a lot of benefits. And I will summarize those benefits which you can then achieve. First of all, efficiency making those plants more competitive in the market, creating short-term revenues, which allow them to further invest into the next stage of innovation. You have gained a more improved process insight, which allows you to experiment more and to deploy novel technologies, which in the beginning you were afraid to apply because you lacked the knowledge to apply them. That creates a new energy ecosystem. In the end, that is the only competitive differentiator, innovation. It is also important to attract talent because people love to work in a place where you can experiment, where you can innovate, because it gives people a purpose. And that is why it's essential in the long run. It's not only about financial and economics, but it's also about talent attraction. This leads then to the final stage where I said I could deliver upon the 36% energy efficiency improvement, which will give the whole new generation extra resources, which in long term buys time to find alternatives for the resources we currently use. Now you might think, if we all could do this, if it's so simple, why doesn't it happen? Yes, it happens, but on a small scale. Why doesn't it happen in a more larger scale? What is hampering us? What are the barriers? As I said in the beginning, those barriers are closely linked to the business paradigms, the business paradigm which we are trained to learn, the business paradigms which are every day applied by business leaders without maybe being consciously aware of it. And I will dwell upon these by looking at what is the reality of decision making today. The reality of decision making today when it comes to investments. We see that what we spend on efficiency is very low it's only a few percent of the total spending. Which is bizarre if you realize that those investments gives the highest return. Very few companies can sustain a return on capital longer term, which is higher than those investments can provide. Also, the risk profile is very low. On the contrary, you see companies spending most of their capital on investment with low return and high risk. Many economists have analyzed that share buyback doesn't generate value for companies. We know that mergers and takeovers have a failure rate which is at least twice as high as the divorce rate of an average marriage. <laughs> so why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? It's a matter of setting priorities and that relates to the paradigm that it's perceived that growth in volume, growth in size, expansion is always better than efficiency. Therefore, we rather build new plants 
which are by no means more efficient than what we already have. It's very often copy could paste, but that is perceived as being better. Also, it is the cost orientation with respect to the value orientation. The operating companies are seen as companies which need to drive on cost and on production volume, not on value generation, not on improvement in innovation. I will give an example of this. This is the slide which you've seen before, and maybe you thought, huh, 4% savings in cost. Well, actually, that's 40% growth in margin. Now we take a value perspective, and now it seems much larger. It gives you a different perspective, and it relates to different priorities as well. So, we need to change this mentality. And we need also to understand that we really need to change the culture in operations, where we take a lot of risk in the commercial side, but we take very little risk in the operational side. So we should balance that risk. And let's then try to come up with recommendations for future leadership in order to make this change happen. First of all, the easy part, we should increase the budget of capital efficiency. I don't say spend more, I said allocate it differently. Easy to do. The second one is a bit harder, and the second one is related to the change in the target setting, where we should say, give those operating companies the targets on innovation, give them the targets on revenue and value. So not only on the cost side of capital, but also on the loss of operations. So that change in focus. The last one is the most difficult one. We need to change the operational culture. We need to get this other orientation Smart and creative people are working there as well. So it's not about people, it's really about changing the mentality at the top. Now we've closed the loop. We have gone through all these steps of efficiency, innovation, and sustainability. And this is where I would give my call to action. Are you ready? Yes. Do you want to join this challenge? Yes. Act now.